Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark York, Mass Tort News and Legal Cast, and we are here today with the esteemed Hunter Skolnick, who has just uh, recently uh, left uh, basically the hearing where the uh, verdict award, the jury, uh, found for the plaintiffs on just about all counts and all matters in the New York uh, State Court opioid trial. And with that, uh, I'm going to kind of hand this over to uh, Hunter and uh, let him go into some of the more specific uh, details about the verdict. Congratulations, by the way, to everyone on the trial team. Thank you, Mark. And, 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 and let me start off with thanking uh, everyone who was part of a massive trial team. Uh, Jane Conroy at Simmons, uh, Simmons Hanley, um, uh, my partners, uh, Paul Vidala, Joe Chacho, uh, the state of New York and their team, John Oleski, we worked together. We were in the pits for seven months. And, and I tell people I've been in trial for seven months. They, it it, it, it kind of shocks them. Um, this jury hung in there for this whole time. We went there on June, I think it was June 3rd, we started. Um, and, and we asked for a jury that was going to stay three, maybe four months. Um, and we went through 800 jurors and this group of jurors says we can hold out for as long as you need us. And we selected a group of, of people, uh, conscientious, uh, hardworking people, um, who were willing to give up half of a year, uh, to help us, you know, get to the conclusion of this case. So that's, let me start off with that and thank the jury. Cause those, those are the people that, uh, are, are, are the real, the real, um, heroes in this case. Um, as far as one of the claims, uh, you know, the public nuisance aspect, that's where there was uh, somewhat, it seemed to be uh, a bit of concern, not with your your trial ability, of course, and what your claims were, but some of the, you know, out in uh, California and Oklahoma. And uh, how, that kind of reinforces what the, the uh, substance of, you know, what you were going after, that this is a public nuisance and all the other tragic consequences of what, you know, the pharmaceutical industry was involved in. Let me, let me talk about uh, California and Oklahoma. And it, it was really shocking during the middle of this trial uh, when, the, when the Oklahoma decision came down, you saw the defense team in the courtroom high-fiving each other. And we're in the middle of a trial, then the California one high-fiving. And they immediately started arguing that this court should be bound by those decisions. The state of New York does not have the statutory public nuisance law that either uh, California or Oklahoma had. We have common law public nuisance claim, and we could have a whole law class on that, and, and we're not here to do that. But New York's public nuisance law, as it's derived over the, the centuries, uh, is very clear that if you do something, you may be doing something legal at the time you do it. But if you do something such as um, um, containing waste on your property, and that's legal, you have a license to do it. And what if for whatever reason that waste starts leaching out and it contaminates your community, your neighbor's property and the surrounding area, the public nuisance law provides an avenue for the government to come and stop it and, and find a way to abate that problem, clean it up. <clears throat> so what we're doing here is not unusual under New York law. There was a, a, you'll argue, legal product. They had licenses to sell certain drugs, but they didn't have the right to sell it the way they did. They didn't have a, the right to change the way the drugs were being prescribed. I mean, we have testimony. We, we have them, you know, you know, congratulating themselves that they made pain a market. They made pain a market. They, 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 they themselves, Teva Cephalon, convinced the, the world that pain was now a whole new market to sell. And, and they made billions off of it. And, and that is the public nuisance. That's the same as pouring the chemicals in the property in the beginning and waiting for it to start seeping out into the community and hurting people. So it didn't surprise me what happened out in uh, Oklahoma and California. Uh, it's unfortunate, but there is an argument being made out there that the statute 
does not allow a public nuisance claim if you're doing something legal. And that's the difference. In New York, it can be a legal, you, you, you could be doing something that's perfectly legal, authorized by law, but you can still cause a damage to the community. And that's the difference. And that's why Oklahoma and California have nothing to do with what we would deal, we were doing in New York. Okay. Night and day. Do you think that the uh, there's going to be any appeals coming out of the uh, California or Oklahoma dockets that may or may not, you know, have an effect on anything else that that's going on in uh, your world? I mean, there's going to be appeals out there, but I, it, it, as I said, they have a statutory definition that specifically excludes legal conduct from from as a cause for public nuisance under the law. They got rid of their common law and they have a statute. We don't have that. Okay. Um, also, they have the Pain Act. They have a statute that said, as of a certain date, people aren't getting enough pain medicine. And we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna support more pain medicine in the state. So that was the argument that the courts there hung their hats on. I disagree. I, I think the courts are wrong. And I think the California courts are going to be reversed. Um, but we'll leave that to another day. New York is a totally, totally different um, legal scheme. Okay. Your verdict, uh, you know, with what was going on here, and I know you have the trial that's going to be coming up and the damages, we can go into that. But recently, uh, one of your former co-counsels in the first Bellwether, Mark Lanier, picked up his uh, verdict, uh, that was a jury verdict, I believe. Uh, Very proud of the work that, that Mark did and the rest of the team and, and the people at my office did working on behalf of our clients, Lake and Trumbull County. Um, I wish I could have been, been there, but <laughs> our trial went more than four months and <laughs> I was tied up in two places, but Mark did a fantastic job. That's a very encouraging. Uh, right before we got on, you were going into some of the uh, some of the back issues about uh, the nuances of our verdict. Yes, if you want to go into that yeah, a little bit see. about what what some of the back office conduct that was very negative might be. But what you know, there's no question the jury found, uh, and what I think was was really uh, significant. Tiva, which owns Cephalon which owns the various other companies, including a distributor, Anda. Tiva was, was, was hit with a verdict that was substantial. But each of the other companies, which they acquired, which were independent at different times, also were hit with verdicts. The activist entities, the Watson Pharmaceutical, which was one of the biggest generic makers in the world. But what a little known company that most people don't know is the fourth largest distributor of drugs to pharmacies in the United States, ANDA. ANDA was a company that no one even talked about. And we focused on in this trial and we received verdicts of 25% culpability. ANDA sat back through all of the opioid litigation as if, you know, not us, you can't think we're going to be responsible. They were as dirty as every one of the big three. We always hear big three, but it really should have been big four. And 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 it now you know has had their their moment to come to justice. But another aspect of this case that is actually getting a, a little bit more attention than I than I ever ever really thought about. In our case, the defendants tried to blame all the other companies that were no longer in our trial. Remember, we're the only trial that ever sued everybody in the pharmaceutical chain, all the manufacturers, all the distributors, all the chain pharmacies. We had them all. We had over 105 lawyers in a courtroom back in June where we had to try the case in a law school auditorium. We had our audience sitting up in the balcony and 105 lawyers sitting in a, in a massive auditorium and, and uh, because the COVID rules, I mean, you can imagine how big the room had to be to have 105 lawyers in there. As the months went by, we had settlements after settlement. And at the end of the day, we're down to a small handful of remaining defendants. So what did they try to do under New York law? They said, you know, 
don't blame us. But if you blame us, don't forget about the other companies. Go blame them as well. So now the burden shifted to the defendant to prove the culpable conduct of the settling defendants. First of all, they started the trial hugging each other and they were brothers in arms. Then all of a sudden they're like, aha, we're not brothers in arms anymore. Blame them. So right there, they had a real uphill battle, and we pointed that out. But more importantly, what they didn't recognize, and and it was a a fatal flaw to the defense, that under the Controlled Substances Act, both in the state of New York and the federal, you have an obligation to know your customer and your customer's customer. You're responsible for your product downstream. And what we had here was these defendants trying to blame their own customers. You had companies that were, had contracts with Purdue to manufacture the pills for them or to label the pills for them and what we call white label them, put them out under their own names. So they're all in bed with Purdue and then they're trying to say blame Purdue. Then they're saying blame Watson. Guess what? Watson had a contract with all these companies. Then they said blame the big three distributors. It's all them. They should have been the ones controlling this. Well, we showed the jury, I think it was between 75 and 95% of their product all went to those distributors. So that was their customer. So they're blaming their customer for for inappropriate marketing or, or, or shipping. And their obligation under the law was to know what their customer did. And then they said, blame the chain pharmacies. And guess what? The chain's pharmacies had contracts with them as well. That was their customer, and it was also their customer's customer. And they were putting in evidence that we didn't didn't object to it. We said, go go ahead, put your evidence in. Then I got up and said, ladies and gentlemen, you remember the testimony from from Joe Ranasisi, the former head of the DEA, Division of Diversion. He told us all about know your customer and know your customer's customer. Well, guess what? Here's the contract that shows this is their customer, this is their customer, this is their customer. In fact, this is their customer's customer. So how are they telling you, ladies and gentlemen, that you should blame them, spread the, spread the blame downstream when all they did was prove their own conduct was bad? And the jury came back. This was a smart jury. They understood it. They blamed the party who violated the Controlled Substances Act and did not let them get away with blaming their customer because that's what the whole purpose of the act was to stop. You can't just say, close your eyes, sell the drug, let someone else take responsibility. Great. Um, Switching gears for a second away from your trial, but some of the culpable conduct and, you know, what they claim are the architects, uh, Sacklers, and (laughs) Purdue Pharma. Uh, You know, there's been a lot of appeals in federal and they jumped into bankruptcy real quick and they thought, that was, I don't know, do you want to call it an easy exit yeah, I, strategy? I was part of the team that negotiated the settlement uh, with Purdue. And then shortly thereafter, before our first CT1 trial, which was my client um, in Cuyahoga County. And, and on the eve of the trial, we, we negotiated the global settlement with Purdue. And then they filed for bankruptcy. And then it all went, it all went south. Right. And, and yeah. there is... Uh, uh, an example is uh, John Kapoor in Insys Therapeutics. They are, you know, Boston, they went right straight to jail. Don't stop. Don't pass go. Don't pass, don't. Do not pass. That's it. Do, right. Do not, do not pass go or whatever. And I mean, they, they were involved in, there were deaths related, but that was much more financial and fraud. There, there were two, there were two guilty pleas for their company. 10 years apart, more. And yeah. and these family members who ran the company um, got away with murder, plain and simple. Kapoor is spending his... We, we, we led part of that that team that, that did the discovery against INSYS. We uncovered all the dirt. Um, Kapoor deserves to be in jail. They, this is a criminal company, criminal um, run by a criminal. Plain and simple. But in my opinion, the Sacklers were no better. Uh, they were worse. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They were worse because Kapoor learned, learned to do what he did from the Sackler model. 
Sure. So that, you know, these, these are all bad people and, and some are enjoying themselves in Switzerland and, and others are enjoying themselves in a federal penitentiary. Uh, I think they all should be in, in the penitentiary. Do you think that uh, with, you know, the, the appellate court getting involved in the Sackler bankruptcy that uh, they are basically going to do what they've always done is throw more money at it to try to work something out that's favorable? Or, I mean, I just, you know, the, they, the company took a guilty plea last, uh, I think it was last August or September, October, yep. and that never even made it into the media, it seems. And here now... It looks like uh, what they were attempting to do is not working out so well, maybe. Yeah, let, I, 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 you know, the one problem we, we, we have to deal with with the Sacklers and, and these were evil geniuses that, that, that started the company, ran the company. When they saw that things were going bad in, in 2007 and the plea was coming, they started to, to funnel the cash overseas. And when you give a billionaire enough time or billionaires enough time to funnel billions of dollars overseas into into family trusts um, that are held in various companies that that as long as it's not a, a, a if it's a financial crime which is what it would be they're not going to give disclosure so it's going to be hard to track that money and everyone wants a pound of flesh but i i think we also want the sackler money to help fix this problem. Sure. So sure. it's going to be a, a tough pill to swallow. And I, 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 I don't mean that tongue in cheek, but throwing more money may be the best and only option in this situation. I don't see any criminal prosecutions happening. Um, I, I see a, a, uh, a financial um, outcome is the best, um, but we're going to have to wait and see because there are some attorney generals that are looking for blood and not just money. So maybe, uh, maybe there will be something more. Uh, one other bit of potential collateral damage is McKinsey. They seem to have gotten uh, just like just a, a little bit of publicity. And now they're running over to the court in the, on the West coast saying, oh, let's, let's get this done. We, we, we were the first ones to sue McKinsey. We sued them in New York. Um, the, the quick settlements happen because of our filing in state courts. They know we represent so many governmental ent governmental entities across the country. Um, everyone cut these sweetheart deals with him, with them. Um, New York State, um, to its credit, made it very clear that they did not settle any of the governmental entity cases other than the state's claim. Uh, we have a viable claim. Uh, it's just a matter of time before we're going to get them back in the court in New York, and we're going to get a New York jury to look at one of the dirtier companies that we have in this world. This company gives advice, and they help companies like this, you know, run by the Sacklers, and they help the various pharmaceutical companies manage their, quote, portfolios of, of opioid products in ways that these companies who were pretty damn smart couldn't think themselves on how to make more money out of them. Sure. So McKinsey sure. is bad. Um, and I think we're going to show that in a courtroom. It's just a matter of time. And that's another company that has a lot of, a lot of wealth. Um, yeah. You know, and, and they're going to, they probably are going to try to buy themselves out, but I want that story on, I want that story uncovered. Okay. Well, it seems like, you know, that, that everything that, you know, the, the prior 10 years of bad conduct is really all, coming right out in the open and it's just everywhere with all these companies, they have not too many secrets left. So it, and you going back to your New York trial, now it's going to come into the damages phase. So as you, I'm not asking you to get too far out there, but are you going to have to go plan on months again and going back and forth? No, or? no, no. We, we expect that our side of the trial will be a couple of witnesses. We will put in about a week's worth of testimony. Oh. Um, we are going to be asking for tens of million billions, if not a hundred billion dollars, because the mess to clean up in New York State is is one of the biggest in the country. And these companies, uh, they bet the company, and and now they're going to have to deal with it. And I hope their shareholders understand 
what bad decisions their leadership have made in this case. And, and they're going to find out very soon what a New York jury is going to say.